Chapter three, what is BitShares? BitShares is a DAC, but what does this DAC do? It offers a service. The service is matching willing buyers and sellers of financial instruments and assets. In this chapter, we will focus on how the BitShares platform can be used to create and trade a financial instrument called a derivative contract. Just like in the traditional financial sector, these derivatives become assets available for trade in and of themselves. In the BitShares world, we call these derivative contracts bit assets. These bit assets can be sent from one person to another, just like Bitcoin. This allows for some really interesting possibilities that we will explore together in this series. As we explore these possibilities, I would like you to keep a couple of things in mind. We all know that Bitcoin has some tremendous advantages over all other types of money and payment, but we also know that it has some drawbacks. One of Bitcoin's biggest drawbacks is its volatility. The high volatility of Bitcoin makes it hard for mainstream users to treat Bitcoin as a currency in a self-contained ecosystem. It is true that in some markets, specifically the so-called dark markets like Silk Road, users have been forced to use Bitcoin as a currency in a self-contained ecosystem. But for the mainstream business, Bitcoin is generally received and then immediately sold into a more stable store of value. For this reason, I see Bitcoin's primary use as a payment system. Its tertiary uses are for speculation and as a store of value. If the number of people using the payment network increases, it is likely that Bitcoin price will increase as well. Bitcoin has many uses as a payment network, internet sales, remittances, micropayments, and lots more. But for the mainstream user, and especially for businesses with small margins, the volatility of Bitcoin is too high. Once a payment is complete, many businesses choose to sell their Bitcoins for a less volatile asset, generally trading into their local fiat currency. So what if we could have all of the benefits of the Bitcoin payment network, plus the price stability of things like gold, silver, the euro, or even the US dollar. If a new cryptocurrency could achieve that, then we would see people having no need to immediately sell the coins. They could hold them indefinitely. They could simply save them until the next time they want to use a crypto coin to make a payment. They could do this without fear of what the value might be at that time. This is, in my opinion, the holy grail of cryptocurrencies. One of the many things BitShares has achieved, it is a cryptocurrency just like Bitcoin, but with the price stability of the US dollar, the euro, gold, silver, or whatever asset the customer desires. These cryptocurrencies with price stability are called bit assets. And the first to begin gaining traction is BitUSD. As you might imagine, it functions just like a cryptocurrency, but its value is pegged to the US dollar. One bit USD is always worth close to one actual US dollar. Now, it is important to mention here that the deviation between one bit USD and one US dollar is already less than one to 2%. Now, this margin will continue to close as the market depth increases. In addition to bit USD, there is also bit Euro, that's pegged to the price of the Euro. There's bit CNY, that's pegged to the price of the Chinese yuan. There's bit GLD, pegged to the price of one ounce of gold and bit BTC pegged to the price of one Bitcoin. If BitShares achieves a critical mass of users with any one of these, most likely BitUSD, then perhaps businesses will start accepting it as payment for goods and services, just like they do with Bitcoin. If BitUSD does reach that critical mass, I think it could become a significant player in the world of online payments. It could massively help all cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, grow acceptance. Making the deal even sweeter for people to buy and hold BitUSD or any other bit asset is the fact that while you hold it, you earn interest on your balance. This is another powerful feature for everyday consumers. While Bitcoin is phenomenal for merchants, its advantages are not quite as strong for consumers. Paying holders of crypto coins interest on their holdings could be the nudge consumers need to rapidly increase their participation in the cryptocurrency revolution. We will talk more about that in the next chapter when we focus on bit assets. To explain this concept creates a chicken and an egg situation. To understand bit assets, one must understand bit shares as well as the other way around. They go hand in hand and you need to understand both to make sense of them. I think it is useful to hold this analogy in your mind as we move forward. Think of bit shares as a decentralized company and bit assets as its products. If you think these products are useful and will be used by lots of people, and you think the BitShares company can make a profit by providing these products to the marketplace, then you might decide to invest in the company by purchasing BitShares. 
If your predictions are correct, then the value of the company may increase and your ownership portion of the company may increase in value. If you are wrong, then the value of your shares in BitShares may decrease in value. Conversely, you may not be that much into investing and may not have the time to understand how all this technical mumbo jumbo works, but still like the idea of holding your wealth outside of the banks in a stable cryptocurrency that earns interest. If that is the case, you could just use one of the products BitShares offers called BitAssets. I will spend the rest of this chapter talking about the business of BitShares, and in the next chapter, I will talk about the product BitAssets. So what does BitShares do? BitShares is a decentralized platform that allows users to enter into financial agreements with each other. Prior to the invention of the blockchain, doing this in a decentralized way was impossible. In the past, you had to have a centralized trusted party to hold collateral and enforce agreements. Now, cryptocurrency can be used as collateral and the blockchain can be used to enforce contracts. There are lots of different uses for this, but we're going to start by looking at the world of derivatives. The union of blockchain smart contracts and cryptocurrency technology is perfect for derivative markets. For some, derivative markets have a very negative connotation. Now, there's nothing bad or immoral about these financial assets in principle. However, some argue that in the traditional markets, they are under-collateralized and thus dangerous. These arguments may have some merit, but fully collateralized derivative contracts do offer major advantages for businesses with little downside. I will spend just a couple of minutes going through some basics of how derivative markets work. If you are new to this, you may want to review this chapter a few times, but don't worry too much if you don't get it. There is just a couple of main points you need to understand, and I will recap them all at the end. A derivative is a contract that derives its value from an underlying asset. As the price of the underlying asset moves, the value of the contract either increases or decreases. Let's use a real world example to demonstrate. Let's say I am an American television manufacturer who purchases most of his components from China. My supplier in China prices his goods in Chinese yuan. Let's say I am bidding to supply a hotel chain with 2,000 televisions. If my bid is accepted, then I need to know that in six months' time, when I need my components, I can still buy them on the budget despite them if there are any price swings in the Chinese yuan. I have two options. I could just go and buy the Chinese yuan or the components now, but that would hurt my cash flow. Or for a small fee, I could enter into a derivatives contract to guarantee me the price I could buy the yuan for in six months time. This would help my cash flow considerably. So let's say the price of the yuan goes up over the next six months. In this case, I would use my contract to buy the yuan at the agreed upon price. I would be unaffected by the price increase of the yuan. If the yuan goes down, then the person I have the contract with would want to force me to buy the yuan at the agreed upon price. I would be paying over market price for the yuan, but I had the peace of mind that I could afford to purchase it and build that price into my television contract with the hotels. So now let's look at who might enter into that contract with me. The answer is pretty simple. There might be a Chinese manufacturer who uses American parts. They have the same problem in reverse. The Chinese manufacturer wants to lock in a price they can trade in their yuan for dollars at a future date in the same way that I wanted to lock in the price that I could trade my dollars for yuan. You can see how both parties benefit from this agreement. This particular form of derivative contract would be called a future, as we are locking in the future price of a commodity. In this case, the commodities are the US dollar and the Chinese yuan. It is important to note that these are just contracts entered into voluntarily by two parties. They can be any variation of the above example. Now, I'm going to leave the discussion about derivatives there for our current purposes, but I will mention these four important things. One, the size of the derivatives market is estimated to be over $700 trillion. It is humongous. It is orders of magnitude larger than the entire world's GDP. To say that bringing an efficient innovation to that world may have some upside to investors could be the understatement of the century. Number two, if everyone just had a variety of contracts with no commonality between them, they would not be very liquid. Every contract would be unique and not easily transferable. So contracts with standard terms have been formed to solve this problem. For example, you might have a market for a gold futures contract maturing on January 1st and another one maturing on February 1st, but not on all of the days in between. Because everyone in the market has his or her contract maturing on the same day, this allows for a highly liquid market. Traders can trade them minute by minute as the price of the contract fluctuates. 
The derivatives themselves become assets. Even better yet, they become fungible assets. That means that any contract with the same terms as mine is identical and thus can be easily exchanged. This is really important, so please remember that. The derivative becomes a fungible asset itself. The high liquidity and fungible nature of these assets make them very useful as we'll see shortly. Point number three. Contracts are often settled and secured in value only and not in the actual commodity. For example, I may have a contract to buy one ounce of gold from you for $1,200 in 30 days. The current price of gold is $1,200 per ounce, and so you know, we have a 50-50 chance of making or losing money. Now you choose to charge me a small fee for that privilege. But how do I know that you have the gold to give me? The contract would be most secure if you put either the gold or the dollar amount of that gold in escrow with a trusted third party to cover your obligation to me. That would give me certainty that you can deliver on your promise. But gold, wheat, oil, copper, corn, and almost all commodities are clumsy and expensive to move around. So people usually just deposit some dollar amount with a trusted third party as security without touching the underlying commodity. So let's examine that a little closer. Let's say the 30 days has elapsed and I have the right to buy gold from you for $1,200 per ounce, but the price of gold has moved to $1,300 per ounce. So now I must put in $1,200 and you have to put in $100 for me to get a 1,300 ounce gold bar from the market. You can see in this instance that in order for you to cover your promise to me, you only needed to deposit a fraction of the dollar amount of your promise. In order to guarantee me a price of $1,300, you only had to deposit $100 as security. However, at the start of the transaction, we don't know how much the price would swing and how much you will need to cover. Traditionally, the more stable the commodity, the less security there needs to be. But what happens if your security is not enough? Let's say you only deposited $50 as security in the above example, and after 15 days or so, the price of gold has moved to $12.50 per ounce. I have a promise to you to buy for $1,200, and you have $50 as security. If the price goes up any further, there will not be enough to cover the position. At this point, one of two things can happen. One option is for you to put in more security to cover your position. This is known as a margin call. Alternatively, the trusted third party can give me the $50 security now so that I can go and buy a new futures contract for $1,250 using my $1,200 and your $50. Remember that the price of the derivative contract is derived from the underlying value of the asset. The new derivative contract will cost me $1,250 and I am not out of pocket. The important thing to note here is that access to the underlying commodity is not necessary. The actual physical gold is nowhere to be seen in this transaction. These are financial instruments. As long as the value can be transferred, the integrity of the contract is held. The form of that value is not significant. As long as it has value and is preferably liquid, the derivative market works. Point number four. There are lots of people who are putting up security and offering these contracts. And there are lots of people buying these contracts. For these derivative contracts to be created, the two parties need to be paired up. There needs to be a buyer and a seller. But because these contracts are on standard terms, they are fungible. The parties can be interchanged. Let's again look at the above example where you had to put in more security on the 15th day or the trusted third party would give me your $50. In reality, as the $50 security is dwindling, the escrow goes into the market and buys back a contract. This can be any contract of the same type because they are all fungible. So just because the person I was paired up with to create the contract was forced to buy his contract out, does not mean that he must buy my specific contract back from me. In fact, he can buy any other contract of identical terms. In a contract with me, he is the seller at $1,200, and with another, he is the buyer at $1,250. He no longer has any exposure to the price of gold, as he has both bought and sold one ounce of gold. I still have my contract for an ounce of gold at $1,200, even though he has closed out all of his positions. That is the power of fungible contracts. Once these markets hit significant volume, there are always people who are willing to take a position for profit. These people are called market makers. These speculators, for a price, will always take a position and these derivatives can exist indefinitely. 
In a moment, we will see why all of these things are important. So if it doesn't make too much sense at the moment, be patient. I think it will become clear in the next chapter. What is important for you to understand now is that these derivative markets exist and are functioning. To run this $700 trillion derivative markets, there are exchanges all over the world. Huge buildings are erected, thousands of people employed, large bureaucracies are paid for by the taxpayers to reduce fraud and illegal activity, and huge accounting and auditing firms must be engaged to monitor the flow of funds to stop embezzling and other forms of theft. The resources spent on running these exchanges are huge. But obviously, the fees these exchanges charge their users to create, buy and sell these derivative contracts are more than enough to cover these enormous costs. Despite all of these measures, embezzling still takes place, fraud is still rampant and corruption is rife. Blockchain technology promises to create a fraud-free environment. An exchange where we do not have to trust bureaucrats, auditors, politicians, bankers or anyone else. An environment where all of those people are completely cut out. An environment where all we have to trust is the mathematics of the blockchain. And best of all, a decentralized exchange based on the blockchain can make all of these improvements while reducing the costs by over 99%. BizShares is the first decentralized exchange to be released into the ether and I don't think the world will ever be the same again. By downloading the free open source software, anyone anywhere in the world can engage in offering or accepting derivative contracts with anyone else. You do not need any middlemen. You do not need to give up any of your financial privacy. You do not need to trust any other person. You don't even need to trust the person that you're in contract with because the blockchain will enforce all contracts no matter what. Just as derivative contracts become highly liquid assets in traditional markets, BitShares allows users to create these same contracts on the blockchain and trade them as assets. Just as we send Bitcoin to one another now, we can also send derivative contracts. As we said earlier, in the world of BitShares, we call these Bit Assets. We will examine just one of those Bit Assets, BitUSD, in the next chapter, and I think it will really help your understanding of how it all works. But before we do, I think it's worth noting, even if these Bit Assets had no other utility, what we have already learned could send BitShares skyrocketing in usage as an efficient decentralized exchange in a $700 trillion marketplace. As amazing and as exciting as that is, that's not the most exciting part about BitShares and BitAssets. The next two chapters will explain why. By the way, I know this is tricky stuff, so congratulations for sticking with it so far. I really hope you enjoyed this video in the BitShares 101 series. If you want to help BitShares achieve its mission of securing life, liberty and property for all, go ahead and give this video a thumbs up. Share it on social media like Facebook and Twitter. And you can click on the link over here to subscribe to this channel for future updates. To watch the remainder of this video series, click on the thumbnail below me or watch the Getting Started series that will walk you through downloading your free wallet and creating your free account. See you in the next video.